Well, so this is not so much my conception, but my distillation of our conversation from yesterday morning, uh, where we had a lot of ideas circulating, and I listened and, um, uh, you know, in the strange process that we've seen both here and in New York, is kind of a forming field with a lot of chaos and stirring, and then things become clear. So something became clear to me about, I saw structure in our conversation that I hope will be helpful in framing where we go from here. So before I get into this, just a, a couple of things by way of framing. In, in the course of my work, both with uh, major corporates and with the city of Palo Alto, uh, offering provocations about what we might do and what the future might look like, one of the typical responses I get from people is, well, let's be realistic. You know, surely you're not being realistic. And as Hazel pointed out, realistic means paying attention to reality. And what Frank was talking about yesterday is the laws of nature. You know, being realistic means paying attention to the physical world and how it's worked for the last, what, 3.8 billion years, providing free open source R&D for us about how our systems could work. Um, and so, you know, with that in mind, and Pavel, thank you for your very quick uh, but powerful framing of, uh, of the, you know, both the evolution and the history of economic systems. We take what we have we take what we have now for granted as reality, but you know, capitalism is what, 200, 300 years old, maybe? Um, uh, capitalism as we know it now, uh, you know, the business roundtable statement that came out a couple weeks ago about the purpose of business uh, refuted something that was only standing for 50 years, you know, since the time of Milton Friedman uh, and his pronouncement that the only purpose of business is return to shareholders, which happened coincidentally perhaps at about the same time as the Powell Memorandum, which set the course for the neoliberal revolution in the United States. So you know, these things that we take as permanent come and go. Um, Peter Barnes, the founder of the Working Assets Financial Services Company, proposed some decades back uh, that we could think about hybrid systems. He used the term eco-market socialism to suggest an economic system that operated within the boundary set by the laws of nature, the allocation mechanisms of the free market, and social ownership of major resources as a one suggestion of the kind of hybrid that we think about. So with that as background, before I show you the map, I just want to reach, let me have the other slide first, Cynthia. Yeah. Let's go with that one. Thank you. Oh, can I do it here? Here we go. Um, can you speak from here? Can I do that? Yeah, very yeah, good. So I just want to offer as a framing the um, something called the Honorable Harvest from a book called Braiding Sweetgrass by Robin uh, Kimmerer. Robin is a an ecologist and a member of a member of Potawatomi Nation of Native peoples of Turtle Island. And the book is a remarkable weaving of modern science and native wisdom. Uh, and she talks of the honorable harvest. I'm sorry, some of the text is obscure here. The honorable harvest is a practice um, both ancient and urgent, applies to every exchange between people and earth. Its protocol is not written down, but if it were, it would look something like this. Are you able to read it or should I read it aloud? Read it. Read it. Read it. It's nice to hear it. And, and, and this is, for me, the frame around global systems change and reality-based economics and all that we're talking about here. And I just discovered it a week ago. All of a sudden, I'm seeing this book everywhere in every conversation I go to, and I want to, I'm, you know, uh, I'm excited about it, I guess. I'll say that. Um, the Honorable Harvest, ask permission of the ones whose lives you seek. Abide by the answer. Never take the first, never take the last. Harvest in a way that minimizes harm. Take only what you need and leave some for others. Use everything that you take. Take only that which is given to you. Share it as the earth has shared it with you. Be grateful. Reciprocate the gift. Sustain the ones who sustain you and the earth will last forever. and for the tens of thousands of years of human tradition that this comes from that you see echoed all over the planet in indigenous cultures, very much in contrast to the systems that we operate in, which depend on extraction 
of resources and appropriation of value and alienation of relationship, which is, you know, for some people, a pretty good definition of modern capitalism. Uh, to your point about reciprocity, I think that's in the mix there. So, with that as a frame that I think is in the background of our entire conversation, here's what I heard us say yesterday. Um, there are two sectors that we are potentially operating in, government and private. Uh, in the modes of action in the government sector are primarily taxing, spending, and regulation. In the private sector, the modes of action are savings and investment, spending, the ways that we vote every day, and what I'll call citizenship, which is the actions that we take in the conversations that we have as people in the world. The drivers for each of them, uh, for government selections, obviously, contributions, certainly in the United States, very differently than in many other countries, and uh, power and the interpretations of power, what governments see is happening in the world and conclude that they need to do in order to protect what they consider to be the interests that they're there to protect. For the private sector, by which I include people as well as corporations here, it's our aspirations, our sense of return on our investment in formal or informal ways, um, and fear of what might go wrong. So Mahatma Gandhi said uh, years ago, he said, problem isn't really hate, the problem is fear. And in, in, in the framework of the conversation, how do we move five trillion dollars toward the SDGs, or as Stefan talked yesterday, various other scales of play we might think about, some of the ideas we were talking about was in the realm of government is ending destructive subsidies, pricing and or taxing externalities, and taxing financial velocity. In the private sector, I group these as two. One is financial system innovation, uh, development of new funds, structural and process innovation in the financial industry, uh, boycotts and boycotts and consumer action of various kinds, and what I'll call shifting the story of the world, because I think we are in a battle for that right now. And I know some people are uncomfortable with the word battle, but be that as it may. Uh, that's how I see what we are in in this moment in history. And that you know, takes the shape of marketing campaigns, social and political movements, leadership, people standing up and saying, making declarations about who we are and where we're going. Um, and um, someone talked about, uh, I think it was you, Kimberly, talked about re re results-driven change. You know, the feedback system of seeing what happens and using that information to guide where we go. So this is what I heard us saying yesterday. It's not complete. There's certainly more that we can add to it. But my hope is that this structure will help us do something more than just brainstorm a lot of ideas, but generate ideas and put them together into something that might start to look like a strategy. Okay. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you. there just in case there's questions. Oh, and let me just add the question mark. So there's obviously an overlap between these sectors. I didn't attempt to fill that in as the question mark suggests. We might, this might be something that we might want to think into a bit. And maybe, Gary, maybe let's just take a couple of minutes to see if there's any questions or reflections from the room about what you're seeing here. Lawrence? Um, Kill okay, some. That's, that's awesome. It's perfect. It's perfect. It's perfect. Oh, sorry. I should be better. So Gil, that's awesome. I think it gives it a perfect map and a perfect foundation. I, I personally don't see anything that's missing other than things that might um, things that might confuse things more or make it more complicated than they need to be. I think it's, it's beautiful the way it is and you've encapsulated it perfectly. One of the things that I want to continue with the discussion as we go forward, which I think you know, you know when you have these things, is really now mapping you know, the six or four or whichever relevant objectives that came out of the UN meeting to where these are, and I think that'll be, between those two components, will be grounded beautifully. Okay, well, let, me, let me restate those. Would you? Yeah, please. Sorry, I've got my phone back here. Appreciate it. Elsie was, was just asking about the five trillion dollars. As I understand it, that's the estimated budget for what it will take to achieve the SDGs. Mm -hmm. 
So that was one marker that we used. That may not be the complete transformational budget that we need to think about, but it's very specific and concrete. And of course, the SDGs have, you know, essentially fairly complete international buy-in as what we were focused on. So that seemed like a good place to start. Uh, six groups that came out of the sessions at the UN, which uh, were, I think we may have mentioned this, were structured kind of differently than what we've done here. Here we've had a number of presentations. There were very few presentations, a lot more interaction in small groups. Uh, building relationship, uh, not being quite sure where we were going until things really gelled in the afternoon of the second day. Um, which resulted in six working groups that are going to continue going forward from there. <clears throat> One um, is global systems change for the common good. Um, you've heard Frank talk about global systems change. There'll be more today on that. The common good was an articulation of what the social investment movement and others have been driving toward for all these years. It harkens back, obviously, to the notion of commons and the Magna Carta and the Charter of the Forest, which happened at the same time as the Magna Carta. Uh, so this is a financial system, in, a financial sector initiative focused on global change, and the notion is to bring together the 35 largest asset managers in the world, perhaps with the UN convening, um, um, to invite their focus on that agenda. I won't go into more detail about it now, we can talk more about it later, but that's sort of a, a a very strategic, very high leverage play to focus attention on this. And you'll just, I'll, I'll add two parts of that. The other part was also um, you know, at the center of the system change and then the, the core, the personal branding. So it loops around your stuff really nicely, but we'll get into that later. I yeah, yeah, that's perfect. Yeah. Um, and there are, there are a number of efforts to link uh, corporate um, regeneration initiatives with consumer action grants for good, a number of others. Um, uh, so, I mean, we can lo lots we can unpack on that. Second is a conscious investing focus on food and energy as critical sectors for the transformation. Uh, third is evolution of consciousness, a theme that was you know, part of the framing for this gathering and a theme throughout the discussions in New York. Uh, fourth was deepening the notion of common good capitalism. Uh, fifth, uh, working on the 2020 United Nations Summit for Future Capital, which is one of the uh, 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 seed intentions of this series of gatherings. Uh, and sixth was building out a platform to actually support the work of the future of cap future capital network. So those are the six pieces that came out of the Empress of New York. Uh, not meant to be exclusive, but there's other things to add. Let's add them, but that framework is already there in motion. Can that be sent to those of us that were not able to be at the UN? The, the, the groups, yeah. Yeah, we're, we're actually um, in the process. Each, each head of those groups is in the process of uh, preparing those reports. And we'll make sure we get those out to everybody. Which takes a little time, but I understand why we're just out to let them. A couple of things to add here. Um, uh, Gary, Paul, and, and, and Gil, I think, in this presentation. Uh, and you pretty much covered everything. Um, but I guess it's more complex than that, as things usually are. Um, and, you know, not to expand the scope, but, it, you know, the, the, the third of the final masters I did was in... The final, uh, final so far. For so far, <laughs> was in uh, financial globalization. And, okay. and yeah. you know, it's a bit of a chicken and egg problem. Like, the big <laughs> finance people know that where they put money drives the pace and direction of globalization. And finance, in turn, is now driven by emerging tech. So I'm pointing out to the dependencies in the system. So it's, it's, it's not just everybody understands that, but do they care? That, 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 I think, is a bigger question. So I agree with everything here. But it's one of those, like. Let me, let me just say something to that. No, Ru? Sure. I mean, my sense over the years is that people actually really do care uh, and care deeply. It's one of the things that characterizes human beings, but they are afraid of what they care about. Or they're in despair and resignation about, I care about that, but it could never be, so I'm not even going to think about it. I'll go off and go bowling or read People magazine. But so, so I think our challenge is how do we bring care alive 
into right. financial systems. I mean, it's sort of happening already with emerging tech. You know, we, we haven't touched upon that yet in the panel so far. Maybe a word in the in the breakout session. Um, this is already happening. People are bypassing the government sector and the private sector and you know, doing transactions of blockchain. I don't think it's mainstream yet and certainly not obsessed by it. But um, obsessed with it, but, um, but you know, there are initiatives to bypass a system which many believe cannot be changed. Um, so I think framing that in the larger agenda is, is something I would like to point out. To how, how would you suggest we do that? I don't have the answer to it, okay. to be honest with you. Okay, we'll see what emerges. I'm working right on a book on that, so let's talk about it. <laughs> okay, good. I mean, and this is, you know, this is not a, this is not the end of today, this is the beginning of today, so let's use this as a provocation. I do have something I call, if, if I may, just um, what I call the five pillars of uh, what would be the tech and the new economy in the future. One is decentralization, transparency, privacy, speed, and scalability. Um, one of the frameworks I yeah, well, we're going to we're going to break up into small groups shortly, so we'll have a chance to articulate that further. See so where that fits in, Michael and then Mila. Yeah, I'd, I'd could like you to go on mic, please. Hmm? Could okay. Mike? Could you go on mic? Mike for Mike. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to spend just a minute or two talking about what I think is an essential topic that deserves future consideration and discussion. That is simply a matter of nomenclature. What do we call this new economics that we're all in favor of and we're struggling towards this, but yet uh, we use different terms for it. And I think that if we can understand the range of terms and the pros and cons of the different terms that are used and come together, perhaps if you have a single label for this, that it, as well as the old economics you're trying to get, get rid of, then I think it helps moving forward. Now, let me just give a list of the terms I'm familiar with. I uh, just mentioned right here, it's common good capitalism, uh, realistic cap capitalism, uh, hybrid economics, uh, green economics, or green new deal, environmental economics, there's an old book in that by Robert Constance et al., science-based, uh, human-centered economy, which is uh, what WASS is promoting, I prefer appropriate economics or 21st century economics. Uh, Neva Goodman, who's one of my favorite economists, has contextual economics in her two textbooks. Uh, the old economics that you're trying to get away from, I consider is very simplistic as we move into a complex era. So it's simplistic, it's unreal. It's, you can uh, uh, denigrate it by calling it 20th century economics. Uh, zombie economics, which has been used in a couple places. There's a book from Princeton with that title, and Paul Krugman has used it to, to um, uh, denigrate uh, trickle-down theory. And then free market economics is why we use uh, by people. So and, all these labels. And, and, and there are more, there's, you know, there's reality-based economics, which I just mentioned in Peter Barnes's Equal Market Socialism, um, and, uh, Col and, and, and colonial economics, and many more. Uh, we decided in New York that we weren't going to focus on terminology, um, although we recognize that that's something that's going to have to emerge in this conversation, but we didn't think it was the best use of our time together here. And that's not for today. And that's not for today. So, you know, but at some point, it's worth absolutely. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, absolutely. Absolutely. Let's get it on the map. You know, we, you know, sure. For a bunch of us in New York, common good was a good enough placeholder. Actually, one of the guidelines that you guys have put out for New York was to focus on what's good enough for this conversation, not try to get to definitive precision, but close enough, more or less understanding what we're talking about, and let us move forward and get more precise as we go forward. But thank you for laying that map out for us. Um, Gil, uh, if, just to be clear, yep. uh, we wanted to go a little beyond this. This is a good, uh, but we're running into the whole rest of the day okay. for each minute so we take. So should I take these two hands that are up? Well, I'd just like to be clear. If okay. it's, so if it's, be one, one second. Okay. Oh, sorry. Sorry. The, the, clear, the clarity we need is to know what we're, right now, what's the topic. The topic is you've scoped out the territory. Mm -hmm. And that would, you have added some important dimensions to that. Uh, I think the right question for us right now, we're going to go into discussion of it, but the right question for us now is, have we missed something that you think is important that should be on the, uh, on the agenda for consideration? And if we get that, if we say yes or no, we've got what we want, then we're going to talk about 
uh, where should we be focusing and where do each of you think and what are the opportunities in each of these areas? So let's just stay with that question. Have we missed anything essential in the map plus Navroop's contributions? Okay, so Mila? No, no, Jake, okay, Thomas. Jake, and, uh, Thomas um, I was just going to immediately connect to the last question. I think we face a strategic choice here like we did in New York. Unspoken, the choice in New York was uh, do we run with the SDGs or not? Yep. And we made, without very much discussing it, the choice to run with the SDGs. And Frank pointed out that there are a set of targets that don't necessarily address the root causes. And that root cause, to address those root causes, we need economic political reform. Okay. <laughs> We're talking about that today. And we need to choose whether we want to run with something that already exists, like the SDGs, in that territory or not. And I think, I don't know, but just I feel that uh, the idea of a Green New Deal that is now rising in the US is a, 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 a movement. There is something moving there already. Do we want to? get behind that, or do we want to reinvent the wheel or have a different terminology? This is a fundamental strategic choice. Yeah, I think that's a very good question. My sense of where we wound up at New York was that we could use the SDGs as kind of a launch pad. Next step that's right there before us in place, move on that and then step off from there to whatever we think is next. But that's sure open for discussion. Peter. I'm not sure if this is what you mean by aspirations and fear under the private drivers, but I think at the risk of it not being what you mean, I think something that's missing there is grassroots action. Um, and we've seen a lot of this playing out in the media in different types of things. I, I, I put that in here, but let's spell that out more. It really shouldn't be under financial system innovation, but it's a financial system leverage. Grass grassroots action needs to be their movements and the rest, for sure. Right, because it's fundamentally shocking the demand process. Okay. Okay, it just wasn't explicit, so I didn't yeah. see it. So this, is, um, this was very fast yeah, yeah. simulation of a pretty wide range of conversations, so you know, you take this and change it. Um, Elsie and I think that Paul and I, I, I yield. Okay, great, Elsie. Thank you for doing this. Um, it really helps us focus and it's actionable. Uh, picking up on what Thomas said, I am um, interested in us keeping in context what we're actually focusing on accomplishing, as you are here. And um, so one question I will pose here is, and I'm working from the bottom up here, $5 trillion action, um, is that the low-hanging fruit of a larger agenda? Yeah. In other words, um, it's it's actionable and it works, it's good. But my question is, when this group, WAAS and um, the World Bank and whatever else we're calling ourselves, thinks about its intention as a collective, what is the collective intention of this collaboration and um, what would the outcome look like, okay, envisioning that? working backwards from that, taking into account what we've heard about system change, what Frank has said, things that were said yesterday about <coughs> if impact investing actually were done, we'd still be in the same old paradigm. That really stunned me yesterday. So I'm not, I'm not saying we shouldn't do this, but I ask us to put this in context of transformational change. I don't know if that was clear or helpful, it, it, I hope so. It's, it's both clear and helpful, at least for me. The $5 trillion for the SDGs, I don't think of as low-hanging fruit because it ain't easy. Just how, you know, the low-hanging fruit metaphor is usually what's easy to get to, and this is not a simple lift, but it feels like a very powerful, highly leveraged place to start. Um, and the, you know, the higher aspiration as we talked about on that list of six, for me, is global systems change for the common good. It's kind of a general frame. For me personally, this, and I'll, I'll, I'll say this and then we'll wrap, um, this journey started for me 
you know, almost 50 years ago working with Buckminster Fuller and his team, and I adopted as a 23-year-old kid what Bucky had talked about as his personal philosophy, which is to uh, build a world that works for 100% of humanity in the shortest possible time through spontaneous cooperation without ecological offense or the disadvantage of anyone. So for me, that's the organizing principle behind everything that I've been up to. I think that's suggested in this common good phrase that we're using as maybe a simple handle that people could grab onto and feel comfortable with and actually feel inspired by to be able to build this out.